request granted. <coughs> Fucking smoke machine. Hello there, viewers. Congratulations, you survived 2020. And I really do mean that this time. What a year 2020 was, and the fallout from it is still continuing. I have decided to escape all the hideousness topside by hiding deep underground in my very own personal Führer Bunker. <laughs> Don't read too much into that, it's just a phrase. Is it though? <laughs> those are uh, those are just collector's items. Yeah. Anyway, let's get on with the show. Ah, do you remember 2019? Gosh, it seems like a whole different world looking back. As 2019 ended, we were all optimistic. A new decade would begin. A possible second Roaring Twenties. Looking back at the 20 teens, how will history remember that period? Probably as the decade of superhero films and fidget spinners. Ugh. But forget the past. 2020 was upon us, and even Britain's own Prime Minister, Boris Johnson, assured us it was going to be a fantastic year. Let the good times roll! Oh, shit. January would start with America blowing up Middle Eastern Sean Connery impersonator Qasem Soleimani, who was actually a beloved military general from Iran. This would lead to all sorts of escalations of conflicts in the Middle East and cause tension on the geopolitical stage. Thanks, Trump. You got people tweeting hashtag World War III. A couple of days into New Year's and already things were looking dire. Oh, and there were fires raging in Australia too, and many a boomerang fucker was getting displaced or turned into a crispy critter. Even the cuddly wuddly koala bears were getting cooked on the barbie. These portents of the apocalypse didn't stop, as after that there was an outbreak of a strange virus in China. It seemed like a new cold virus or something, but it would turn out to be the dreaded coronavirus. Oh, more good news. This awful virus would completely overshadow 2020 and ruin everything. At the time, we were clueless. We had no idea of the ramifications of this deadly coronavirus that we had a 99% chance of surviving. But we didn't know that back then. You're probably sick of hearing about the coronavirus by now. You've had over a year of it and are still getting punished by it. So from now on, I'll call it other names. The Cantonese cough and sneeze started in China, Wuhan to be precise, and it had been brewing since late 2019. There's much debate on its origins. Some say it was zoonotic, meaning a Chinaman ate some bad bat soup and got sick. Others think it was a man-made virus that had escaped from a virology lab nearby. It's hotly contested, but the CCP were quick to cover up the initial outbreak of Kung Flu. Journalists disappeared. Doctors who blew the whistle disappeared. And there were strange goings on in Wuhan as the government tried to contain the outbreak. Worrying footage started leaking from behind the red curtain, and it was alarming to say the least. Awful. Just awful footage. Please, if you ever find yourself in a horrendous situation like that, hold your phone sideways. That way, it doesn't have those black bars at the side, and it's more cinematic. Honestly, people, get your priorities straight. Residents of Wuhan and other Chinese provinces were experiencing fever, coughing, and loss of smell, which was convenient considering the amount of reeking bullshit that was coming from the World Health Organization. While the WHO was trying to placate Daddy China and stop the world from panicking, the Shanghai shivers were spreading to neighboring countries. But that was in those loser countries, away from all my nice stuff, so I couldn't care less. Wasn't affecting me, yet. Celebrity Gwyneth Paltrow weighed in with some health advice. Of course, she knows medicine. She knows how to make everyone feel better. What pearls of wisdom can she impart to us mere mortals? You're in luck, because Gwyn decided to Netflix and shill with her wellness propaganda series, The Goop Lab. 
The series tried to sell shit to gullible health freaks, but I found it to be a great insight into the overinflated ego of a batshit insane celebrity. The name Goop Lab is very misleading, as there is no laboratory or any medical equipment. It's just a nice looking office filled with neurotic pampered idiots from California. You may have heard of Goop already, as Gwyn has been in the news for promoting her awful alternative medicine products and pussy smelling candles. I already have those at home, Gwyn. They're called tuna cans. Why is Gwyneth Paltrow an authority on health? Well, um, uh, her credentials are she, uh, she starred in those Marvel films and played a fat girl one time, so give her money? Yet people do spend money on her website and her treatments, despite Gwyneth Paltrow being a celebrity with no medical training of any kind. But she knows what's healthiest for us plebeians, like putting rocks in your vagina. Sticking random things in your squish box is a great way to get toxic shock syndrome, Gwyn. So Boss Lady Gwyn and her cohort of ass kissers explore all sorts of quackpot alternative therapies and health guff with nothing but anecdotal evidence and the placebo effect to back them up. Every episode starts with positive fuzzy wuzzy sound bites, followed by a big fuck off disclaimer saying this is all bollocks, which completely undermines the whole series, as well it should. At Goop Camp, Oberstormbannfuhrer Gwyn interviews a range of hippie weirdos who haven't been told the 70s ended to discuss various bits of made up woo woo about health. Next to Gwynnie Poo is her loyal nodding dog who agrees with everything Gwyn says who I found really distracting because she looks like the female twin of Henry Cavill. After discussing health therapies that have no basis in science or even reality, Gwyn tests out their theories, although she doesn't partake in the really grueling human experiments. Instead, she sends off her brown-nosing minions to do the job for her. Yet they don't mind because Gwyneth Stooges are in love with her. If she farted on a cold window, they'd be there to lick up the condensation. So they get drugged up on psychedelics, exposed to hypothermia, and receive horrendous facial abuse. Beauty treatments or medieval torture? You decide. It was hard to feel any sympathy for these human guinea pigs because they were so irritating to watch. These goop sycophants don't have two brain cells to rub together, and they all speak with an upward inflection, so they sound like airheads. I'm one of the food editors at Goop. And I'm here because I think I just need to learn how to breathe. And none of these halfwits have any ailments to cure in the first place. At most, they have a slight sense of anxiety or just a fear of getting old. Throughout the show, there is all this rather vague terminology to contend with. Energy, auras, wellness, which all translates to New Age mysticism with a $300 price tag. The credulous fuckers at Goop are very biased, and there is no counterpoint to any of these wellness or beauty treatment claims. Experts spout psychobabble or appeals to nature, and everyone nods and agrees with it. They make the bias worse by adding in one-sided glowing testimonies from people who've tried whichever alternative therapy crap they're currently discussing. The one time the show gets a glimpse of self-awareness, it quickly dismisses it. You know, woo-woo, you know, bullshit, not true, just, you know, a bunch of privileged people in L.A. But, you know, at the same time, I was curious. I wanted to get on the table myself. Each episode is a chance for a charlatan to plug some shitty wellness product and get some naive retards to try it out. Goop staff get drugged, manhandled by healing energy experts, and lectured by supposed psychics who couldn't find their ass with both their hands. Afterwards, Gwyn interviews her staff and they babble on about how what they endured was a positive, life-affirming experience. They certainly can't say otherwise or else they'll be fired. The worst Gwyneth goes through is eating reconstituted slop and getting blood smeared on her face. They say they used Gwyneth's blood, but someone really should check the local area for missing children. After six episodes, it's safe to say there is no educational merit to this so-called documentary series. The most educational episode was the one on female orgasms, and even then the advice was, find the devil's doorbell and you're all set. Great episode, as it showed that gynocentric Gwyn doesn't actually know what a vagina is. 
The vagina is only the birth, birth canal? canal? Oh, see, I'm getting an anatomy lesson that I didn't. I thought the vagina was the whole... No, 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 no. Do not watch this series and don't listen to Gwyneth Paltrow because she is bad for your health, both mentally and physically. In all of 2020, I think there was only one decent Netflix series, and that was Tiger King. For months, everyone was talking about Tiger King, a documentary series on the exploits of exotic animal handler Joe Exotic, who is an eccentric fellow to say the least. Hey, I'm Joe Exotic, otherwise known as the Tiger King, the gay gun cane redneck with a mullet. Joe has popped up on my radar before, as he appeared in a Louis Theroux documentary, and I do like my Louis Theroux. You a rare nigga? What do you think? But Mr. Exotic was quite tame in that. In Tiger King, his over-the-top personality truly comes out, and what results is a roller coaster ride of endangered animals, murder, feuds, drama, and a look into the seedy world of the exotic animal trade in the US. It was very gripping, as there were twists and turns at every corner, plus interviews with shady fuckers who own zoos and sell animals. The whole series quickly turns into hillbilly Game of Thrones, where everyone is a different flavour of asshole. Eh, that doesn't sound right. Anyway, while I enjoyed the show and its narrative, I believe you should never take a TV show at face value. There was supposition that one zoo owner, Carol Baskin, killed her husband, and so fans of the show started harassing her over it. Despite Joe being a crazy tiger lover who is imprisoned for animal abuse charges and conspiracy to hire a hitman, fans found him a sympathetic character who ought to be freed. People were half expecting Joe to get a pardon from President Trump, and they even had a black limo waiting outside his prison, just in case. Bloody hell! The man is no saint, but a well-made documentary series seems to get everyone on his side despite his crimes. Is that all it takes to win over the court of public opinion? Here's some advice for you criminals out there. Don't hire a crack legal team to defend you. Just get Netflix to make a well-edited documentary about you and your crimes. Then everyone on social media will come defend you and you'll get off scot-free. It was a good series, oftentimes unbelievable in its sheer madness, but entertaining nonetheless. Everyone on planet Earth watched Tiger King, and for good reason, because for most of the year, you had a choice of watching this or screaming at the walls. In other news, the rice rabies would soon arrive in Europe and the Western world. China was not quick enough to contain the outbreak of Wu flu as it started spreading all over Asia, but now there were reports of outbreaks in America and Italy started to see a surge in cases. Because the virus came from China, the mayor of Florence was worried that Chinese people would be ostracized by Italians, so he helped encourage the Hug a Chinese Day. Are you kidding me? That is the easy setting on virus simulator game Plague Inc. Not that Chinese people get to play that, their government banned it for some reason. Guess it hit too close to home. The Jinping sting struck Italy hard, and many Italians went into quarantine. The media was quick to show us our upcoming future of empty store shelves and being confined to our homes. The globe watched in horror as the Beijing bug spread far and wide. News outlets filled our screens with dying people on ventilators, and we started to get scared. In no time at all, nearly every country had an outbreak. Grannies the world over were filling their colostomy bags with fear, as they were the most likely to be affected by the Wuhan wheeze, whilst the youngsters embraced the nihilism by licking toilet seats and partying on. Despite the fear over the pandemic, the carefree whippersnappers were gorging on a bevy of COVID memes as the world went into panic mode. Indeed, everyone's panicky herd instincts kicked in. Soon, shops were being raided for supplies, and scalpers were hoarding protective masks in a bid to make bank from the chaos. As a result, some people had to improvise masks, and there were shortages of protective gear all over the world. I was hoping with all this mask wearing, there would be a resurgence of cutie cyber goths popping up. 
But alas, it was not to be, and what we got instead was angry middle-aged women screaming about masks and death. The media didn't want us informed, but in fear. News outlets relished in the panic and mayhem, telling us the shops were chaos with death just around the corner. The media was more than happy to guilt trip us over mask usage while being utter hypocrites about it themselves. See, here, just around. Nobody's wearing them. Nobody's, uh, the there you go, including the cameraman. Yeah. Katie. Striking images. Cal Perry. Cal, thank you very much. The power of the media was absolute, and our fears were magnified tenfold as everyone devolved into scared animals fighting over toilet roll. For some reason, herd mentality afflicted people so badly that there were fears over toilet roll shortages. Everyone started bulk buying shit tickets in case society collapsed tomorrow and they were stuck with a dirty ass. Do you really need that much toilet paper? I suppose if things get bad you could eat it, and get the added bonus that it wipes you on the way out. Meanwhile, the stock market went on a skydiving holiday due to panic buying and quarantines being imposed. Stockbrokers were now shitting themselves, and because of panic buying, they had no toilet roll either. Countries soon started printing money to offset the economic hit. Doomsday preppers felt vindicated for once. Finally, all those years of hoarding beans and guns would pay off. A lifetime of zombie movies and post-apocalyptic gaming made us all think the end times were here, and it was just like those video games. Many geeks saw themselves as hardened post-apocalyptic survivalists, but in all probability, if the cough apocalypse really did come, they were most likely to end up as a human sex toy for some bandit leader. As the Fu Manchu fever raged on, we all entered the new normal. Governments all over the world started enforcing strict rules and restrictions we had to follow to reduce infection rates. We, the people, now had a new rigorous routine of disinfecting ourselves so we could go outside to get a bag of pasta only for the shelves to be empty. Everyone was made to wear a mask, or at the very least a face covering. Although, some people wouldn't wear it over their nose, making the whole thing redundant. The poo flu platter could enter your eyeballs too, so face shields were implemented, but some people just wore the shield and not the mask, so they could still inhale the particles. Also, you were supposed to change your mask every day and disinfect it, but most people used the same one over and over and kept it in their dirty pockets. You also had to wash your hands every day, and if you were out in public, you needed hand sanitizer on you constantly. Speaking of public, you had to maintain social distancing by staying two meters apart from everyone, but that was near impossible if you had to commute on crammed public transport. Large gatherings were outright banned, no large weddings or funerals or else you get fined. You couldn't attend any large gathering of people. Unless, of course, it was a protest with hundreds of people, then it's all good. Or, if you're a politician, then the rules don't apply to you. Even if you did get caught, the fine wouldn't hurt the pockets of a rich person. Only the underclasses would feel the sting. Everyone else had to wear masks in shops and on public transport, or else you were fined. Unless you were autistic, then you got an exemption card, allowing you the freedom to cough on and be coughed on by as many people as you like. Yay! No, Andy, not yay. Despite all the hand-washing, mask-wearing, and social distancing, it still wasn't enough. As cases rose, we soon found ourselves entering a lockdown. I urge you, at this moment of national emergency, to stay at home, protect our NHS, and save lives. Most of the world went into lockdown, and nearly every aspect of society shut down. No clubs, no school, no work for some, no going to the cinema or the pub, no dining at restaurants, and you couldn't go to the gym. All you could do was stay at home and watch screens. At least we all got to see more television and films. So, what is my top film of 2020? Well, I only got to see one movie before the cinemas closed down. Sonic the Hedgehog! Oh, God. This was Sega's attempt to make a movie based on an iconic classic video game character. Initially, it looked like they messed up big time as they had to delay the film to fix the CGI. This was because they gave Sonic a hideous, child-frightening, uncanny valley nightmare face. <sighs> 
But with a new facelift, the film became more palatable, and honestly, it wasn't bad. As far as video game adaptations go, this was one of the better ones. It had fun action sequences, and the plot is about a wholesome road trip to San Francisco with two friends trying to find a magic ring. Acting wasn't bad either, and Jim Carrey did a fantastic job of hamming up his performance as the infamous Dr. Robotnik. It was an alright film, and I honestly expected much worse. If I was a kid, I'd probably enjoy this more. And if I was a huge Sonic fan, I'd think it was alright. But Sonic fans are notoriously hard to please anyway. Still, it was a fun movie, and it has a timeless message. Ta-da! San Francisco sucks. It sure does. With the lockdowns and new normal in place, people were feeling frustrated. Some people protested against the lockdowns, and I couldn't blame them. This whole thing was just depressing and frustrating. All we could do was stare at screens and feel fear. Out-of-touch celebrities appointed themselves morale boosters in a bid to entertain the masses, but all it really did was show how disconnected from reality they were as they told us all about how quarantine is easy from their hot tubs or lavish mansions. These approval junkies made cringy videos trying to create some sense of solidarity with the common man. Hunky piece of man gristle Henry Cavill made his very own gaming computer to show he's just like everyone else and the internet was in awe. Well, whoop de shit! Other attention-starved celebs couldn't cope with lockdown and had mental breakdowns as they faced actual hardship for once in their sheltered lives. Elon Musk took to Twitter to freak out and have an existential crisis. Good taste in video games, though. Ellen DeGeneres said quarantine was a lot like prison. Oh, my heart bleeds. Oh, God. This cell is just like quarantine. I can only get two bars of signal on my phone, and I've already watched most of the stuff on Netflix and Pornhub. This is pure hell. Hey man, you want me to order some Domino's pizza? I guess so. Will this nightmare never end? Back in reality, us humans had to watch television, but with COVID restrictions and social distancing. This meant we had sports games taking place in empty stadiums, but most of the social distancing got fucked when it came to close contact sports. The news became filled with fear-mongering and brought on experts using shitty Zoom conferencing, and you better pray to God they had a good internet connection, otherwise you'd be told you're going to die in laggy 10 frames per second, unless of course their audio cut out at the important moments. Soap opera actors also had to follow the distancing rules, which made things look awkward as fuck as they yelled their lines at each other from opposite sides of the room. Meanwhile, shows that usually had a studio audience either got rid of them completely or opted for digital audiences that looked like something out of grim dystopian TV series Black Mirror. To match our dystopian television, my own country became even more draconian. The cabin fever set in, and some cretins would try and get their neighbours in trouble for not social distancing enough. The police became even more heavy-handed over fines and restrictions, going so far as to use drones to watch people hiking in remote areas, or polluting the Blue Lagoon to stop holidaymakers. All the while, we were told to just do our part, and all this lockdown bollocks would be over just in time for the summer. We impotently clapped every week for our National Health Service as the media told us that our hospitals and the ones all over the world were practically war zones. This message got completely undermined though by bored nurses making asinine TikTok dance videos. After a while, it became very tedious and disrespectful. Someone help me! I can't breathe! Why are you dancing? Help me! Thankfully, some hospitals put a stop to this after nurses were caught dancing on a cancer ward. Eventually, the lockdowns would gradually ease, but a lot of economic damage was done, and so there were all sorts of funny money schemes to help offset the impact. My government created the Eat Out to Help Out scheme, 
which is not a charity for lonely lesbians, but a foolhardy initiative to get people eating at restaurants again by having the government pay for some of the bill. Except your dining experience wasn't fun, as you got treated like a leper by the waiting staff. Also, with all this money printing, you'd end up paying that bill in full, with interest, when taxes inevitably get hiked up to compensate. It was pointless anyway, as restaurants would go straight back into lockdown again, and the hospitality industry would keep hemorrhaging more money and jobs. Ugh, this is depressing. Time for a distraction review. E3! Oh wait, E3 got cancelled because of the virus. Shit. Well, let's talk about video games anyway. 2020 was a disappointing year for video games. There was a smidgen of good ones, like the new Half-Life VR game Alex with its ultra immersion, and everyone was playing Animal Crossing, although that was depressing as it reminded you that you couldn't go out and socialise in the real world anymore. The most depressing game, however, was The Last of Us Part 2. A much anticipated sequel to The Last of Us, it finally came out and many gamers were displeased. It was a standard cinematic Sony game, which is basically just a film where you press buttons occasionally. Although if it was a film, it would be considered a mess with its poorly written post-apocalyptic story about the cycles of revenge or whatever. Also, there are fungus zombies, but I wouldn't worry about them. The creator of the first game, Neil Druckmann, decided to disappear up his own ass for a spot of sequel writing and came up with this pretentious crap. To be fair, the slide into bad writing was gradual for Druckmann after the first game, especially with its DLC, which was all about teenage lesbians. The Last of Us Part 2 goes overboard with hack writing and contrivances galore. Do you like women on steroids doing a spot of golfing? What about schlocky lesbian melodrama? Or character motivations that change on a whim? When The Last of Us Part 2 isn't being a movie, the actual gameplay is a painfully generic third-person shooter. There are stealth mechanics, a simple crafting system, and you get skill points by eating multivitamins. Multivitamins infused with the very essence of the anarchist's cookbook, it seems. Gulp enough supplements and you get better at crafting explosives for some reason. When I take zinc supplements, I just spunk more. I don't suddenly make better pipe bombs. So much for trying to be a serious, grounded game. Also, there are zombies, but I feel like those are a nuisance that Druckmann begrudgingly makes you fight so he can move on to his next lecture on the self-destructiveness of vengeance in an attempt to be profound. The main characters murder scores of people while feeling no remorse, and then the story has the audacity to get preachy about violence and revenge, so the characters just decide to give up on it all in the end. How anticlimactic. I also lost a few days playing XCOM Friendship is Magic Edition. In this new XCOM spin-off, it's been five years since XCOM defeated the occupying alien forces who tried to genocide humanity. Now, we all hold hands under a rainbow with our new alien friends. Diversity is our strength. Except when it isn't, because some people don't like the new multicultural world and there is a lot of societal unrest. I mean, I can't blame them too much. The aliens did try to turn humanity into green goo. Everyone's bound to have grudges after that. Be that as it may, you, the player, are in charge of Chimera Squad, which is a police force made up of humans and aliens of all shapes, sizes, and fetishes. The gameplay is similar to XCOM 2, with its tactical and strategic layers, but also introduces new gameplay features to the usual XCOM mix, like the new breach mode at the start of every level, where you must find innovative ways to boot fuck a door. Instead of insurgents using guerrilla warfare like in XCOM 2, you play cops using urban warfare. But the results are still the same, and that is giving aliens a bullet bukkake to the face. The game has the aesthetics of a 90s Saturday morning cartoon. It kind of works, except I don't know why the developers gave the fierce mutons dick-sucking lips. Yet the game is let down by awful voice acting and characterization. Everyone talks like a snarky asshole. Where did I see the contents of your unmarked takeout container? Yes, uh, wait. On the end of my fork? No. As I ate the last bite. Shut up, just shut up. The giant snake character doesn't even talk like a 
slithering snake. Instead, she has an American bimbo voice. Ugh, I can taste her sweat. I don't care if they respect me. You care. Whatever. You gonna start wearing sweaters? Apparently, the voice actress didn't know she was playing a giant viper. What the hell was the voice director doing? Overall, this was a simplified XCOM game experience with a novel premise, and it was a very cheap game too. It scratched that XCOM itch for now, and gave Degenerate some more pervy viper fan art. God, I hate humanity sometimes. The biggest disappointment of the year was Cyberpunk 2077. I and so many other people were looking forward to this much hyped up video game. It was going to be groundbreaking, an open world cyberpunk game where you had total freedom and immersive gameplay in a living, breathing mega city. They got Darling of the Internet, Keanu Reeves to star in it. Loads of promotional material was blasted into our face every month and gamers began to see the potential for this game to turn the shitty year of 2020 around. Yet, the writing was on the wall that maybe the game had some problems in its development. For most of the year, the game kept getting delayed, with assurances from the developer, CD Projekt Red, that this would help iron out the bugs and give players the best possible experience. We were eventually told by promotional material that November the 19th would be the day we got to play. And then it got delayed again. However, the anticipation was too strong to cast doubts, and we all got back on the hype train. But its final stop was a disappointment station with a replacement bus service from fuck you loyal fans. After all that waiting, we finally got to play it. And it was bad. Oh no. Oh no. Oh no! The game was fundamentally broken and rushed. For last generation console users, it was downright unplayable. Sony had to remove the game from their online store and offer refunds. This game was a mess and it was now clear why reviewers weren't allowed to use their own footage when the review embargoes dropped. I did manage to play Cyberpunk. It was certainly atmospheric when the characters weren't T-posing and killing your escapism. The sad thing is, you could see the potential. It could have been a great game, a classic even. Instead, it will be thought of as one of gaming's biggest blunders. The damage was done. Gamers were pissed or left disillusioned, and CD Projekt Red's stock value got buggered six ways to Sunday. Worst of all, their reputation was sullied, and who knows if they can ever restore trust with their customers. Oh, 2020. Why did we bother to hope we could have something good? Fantastic soundtrack, though. This is George Floyd, who became a big deal during the month of May when his arrest went horribly wrong and he died. News spread of this very quickly across America, and it's fair to say there was a passionate response. While some people protested peacefully against this injustice and against racism in general, things quickly devolved into mass riots across the USA. The movement quickly got hijacked so twats could loot free stuff or take some validation-seeking selfies, while anarchy spread across America. So much for social distancing, Oh my god, hold your phone sideways! For the media, it was fucking Christmas, a global pandemic, and now Mad Max-style civil unrest. News outlets were enjoying the chaos as it made for provocative entertainment, especially with how brazen some rioters were with their criminal activities. It's an anime gift shop. What oh are boy. these gonna want? These guys yeah. gonna want with anime gifts? They're just destroying something. There goes the ATM. Let's see if we can get the, the license truck. plate. Let's oh, uh, you, let's, oh, get, that let's get that license plate. plate. Let's come around the let's come around the west. Yeah, we'll, no license plate. Oh, no geez. plate. No plate on the rear. So no plate. No surprise. That uh, shows his intent was mm -hmm. to be involved in this from the beginning. Yep. Dude, be glad you took that plate off because we would have got it. Um, yeah, I'm a little angry. Yeah, I'll, I, I will it, share you that. You can't help but feel angry. 
The mainstream media obviously had a narrative they wanted to push, which was that the rioting was some kind of revolution sparked by injustice. This was hard to achieve when your office is being attacked by the very people you're making out to be virtuous. The media wanted violence in action. They got it. It was the people versus the crooked cops, but this narrative was flimsy as fuck. For starters, a lot of law enforcement was sympathetic to the black community, and police officers come in all shapes and races too. Still, the media was having an orgy of crime and violence for breakfast after nothing but months of stale chop fluey news. On social media, there was a glut of chaotic content. Oh shit, they tear gas Hey, it's real! I stole it for the police! <laughs> Many YouTubers took to the streets to be citizen journalists with mixed results. I'm part of the media right here. Sir, it's in my backpack. Or I can go, I can go back to the hotel. I don't want to be arrested, sir. I don't want to be arrested, sir. Sir, I don't want to be arrested. I don't want to be arrested, sir. Sir, I don't want to be, I'm arrested, guys. I'm arrested. I'm arrested, guys. I'm arrested. While some internet trolls had found a new playground. You take a knee for Black Lives Matter. You gotta hold it for at least 10 seconds and hold it in the honor of George Foreman, the man who just died to police brutality. George Floyd. George, F George Floyd. I like George Foreman too. But... Yeah, I'm with Black Lives Matter and I just want you guys to take a knee for George Foreman real quick, the man who just died. Do you have a George Foreman grill? But you gotta get the grill or else you're a bigoted racist. You're apologizing for sincerity for what happened to George Foreman. George Foreman? If you weren't a racist, I would like you to take a knee right now for George Foreman. Take a knee right now. For George Foreman, right now. He's made the best grills and if you don't take a knee, you're a goddamn racist. I am George Foreman and this is my lean, mean, fat reducing grilling machine. It grills delicious food in a healthy way fast. Due to the racially charged nature of the protests, things obviously got political, which meant virtue signaling faceless companies donned their human masks and took to Twitter to post empty platitudes. These felt like they were written by robots, basically not going into too much depth and not offering any solutions to quell the anarchy. Sony was outright flagellating themselves and seemed to be fine with the looting, which is easy for them when you got insurance out the arse. Maybe they felt guilty for their past marketing blunders. Amazon chimed in with support while their delivery vans got raided. EA Sports also showed solidarity. This is the same EA that has been accused of exploiting student athletes for their games in the past and promoting gambling to kids. <sighs> Do you remember when brands just sold you stuff? The protests turned into a sort of franchise as other countries joined in to show sympathy, but it was hard to discern how many protesters were altruistic or just looking to stroke their righteous egos. This was especially true with celebrities. I'm speaking to you from my heart. Look, I don't know if I'm going to have a career after this. Fuck. That block. Millionaire John Boyega there telling us how he'll lose his career by supporting the most socially acceptable mainstream movement there is. The one that's endorsed by every single major corporation. <sighs> These celebrities need to get a fucking grip. Every privileged, validation-seeking celeb had to chime in to say they too hated a bad thing like racism. Next they'll tell us how they also don't like cancer or the kicking of small puppies. No shit! The whole thing was a perfect storm after the damage caused by the rice rabies. All that isolation, closed retail stores and righteous indignation was a catalyst for mayhem. Police and protesters battled it out for weeks. And for what? After the rioting, looting, property damage, bodily harm and hurt feelings, what was accomplished? Absolutely nothing. All that was created was destruction. Race relations fractured further. Hell, some prejudices were reaffirmed. Was all this truly justified? All this destruction and chaos was caused simply because a black man used a counterfeit $20 bill. If I was a chaos theorist, 
I'd have a diamond cutter of an erection right now. The rioting completely eclipsed the only positive thing to happen in May, and that was a historic rocket launch. As America burned, humanity was trying to escape Earth. Lucky bastards. Speaking of space, there were quite a few science fiction shows that came out in 2020. Towards the end of the year, we had season 5 of The Expanse. I must say it was rather mediocre. Ever since The Great Bezos bought the show off the Sci-Fi Channel after they canned it, the story just hasn't been as thrilling. Season 5 was especially mediocre, as half the series was this whingy minge crying, or various characters talking about how bad things were. What really struck me as bizarre is that Amazon tried to promote the show with ASMR sleep therapy from gravelly voiced character Avasarala. Why are you still awake? If you don't fall asleep soon, I'm going to come over there and sing a lullaby. Huh. I didn't think it was possible to get throat cancer in the ears. Some of you viewers asked for my thoughts on The Mandalorian Season 2, and although I said I was done with Star Wars, eh, I might as well give my final thoughts on it. I watched Season 2, and it was... okay. Just okay. And that's the problem with The Mandalorian, it never quite transcends just okay for me. The production values were great this season, the show looks brilliant, and they got rid of those bastard tracking fobs. However, the writing was still poor. It became very repetitive seeing stormtroopers getting slaughtered en masse. Every time there was a mission with an Empire base swarming with troopers, you knew it was going to be a cakewalk. Mando killing stormtroopers with ease is so common that there is no element of danger anymore. When the Mandalorian isn't doing odd jobs, he's a conduit for fan service. Season 2 went overboard with callbacks. Look, it's Boba Fett! Look, it's those overpowered characters from Dave Filoni's animated shows! Let's have these references take up some more screen time away from the central character of the show! It's at this point I would like to reflect on my Season 1 Mandalorian review. No character from the original trilogy shows up brandishing a lightsaber for the sake of nostalgia. Time to eat those words. Yes, the big reveal at the end of the series was a computer-generated Luke Skywalker come to aid Mando and the baby Yoda, who is now called Grogu? <sighs> the fan service was a bit like the Darth Vader reveal from Rogue One, a shadowy figure killing mooks in a corridor. But fans ate it up? And seeing as I'm referencing previous reviews, if there is a future for Star Wars, it will be more of the same. Even more depressing is that with advancements in computer effects, the original characters from the trilogy will be brought back from the dead over and over again until entropy consumes the universe. Is this all it takes to win over Star Wars fans? Throw out an image of Luke Skywalker to get those nostalgia neurons firing up? It seemed lazy, and I don't hold out much hope for the series getting better. The Mandalorian could have been so much more. Looking back at promotional material for the show, it's obvious Disney was reluctant to reveal the babysitting side of things. We thought we'd get a gritty sci-fi bounty hunter show. What we actually got was Mando and the Magic Baby. So much potential, but ultimately, it was wasted. Now, no more Star Wars reviews. Instead, Star Trek reviews. I am actually a Star Trek fan, a recent convert too. For a while, like so many people, I turned my nose up at it. It looks so campy. It's nerd shit. Those were my initial thoughts, but I was wrong, because once you get past the silly aliens, there's actually a fun, clever show to enjoy. I used to watch the occasional episode of The Next Generation when it was on the telly, but didn't give it much thought, and Deep Space Nine just seemed like a soap opera set in a space shopping mall filled with ugly people. At some point, I decided to give Star Trek a chance, and it was worth it. Star Trek used to be a very comfy viewing experience. You had all these diverse, interesting characters who would explore space in all its majesty. While doing this, they would face philosophical or moral dilemmas and solve them just in time for tea. The old Star Trek shows were brilliant. Look at this cinematography. Great, isn't it? You're not looking properly. Let me zoom in and slow it down so you can appreciate this. Good cinematography. 
What? I I'm not a pervert. See? It even fits the golden ratio. Uh, kind of. You had your space battles, sure, but they were used sparingly, and diplomacy was always preferred. The original Star Treks were about being better, creating a post-scarcity utopia, and becoming an enlightened people. The creator Gene Roddenberry made it as a hopeful vision for the future, and the shows were oftentimes prophetic. By the early 2020s, there was a place like this in every major city in the United States. Why are these people in here? Are they criminals? No. After a year of watching lots of Star Trek, I attended my first Star Trek convention. I did not wear plastic ears or any of that nerd shit, but my god, I had a fantastic time. It was the most welcoming and friendliest convention I've ever been to. It was geeky, but everyone treated you like an equal. Star Trek fans, or Trekkies, a really nice, lovely community. You had a range of friendly, diverse faces there, all walks of life enjoying themselves. I felt sorry for what would befall these nice fans. In 2020, CBS gave us non-stop bastardizations of Star Trek. A whole year of throwing any old shit at the wall and seeing what sticks. Spoilers, none of it sticks, and we get to enjoy the wall skid marks. Star Trek fans had to endure a crappy animated show, Captain Picard clinging to relevance, and Season 3 of Discovery. What makes the last two such bad additions to the franchise is how tonally different they are from the original mellow and comfy Star Trek shows. Why bother calling them Picard or Discovery? Cut the crap and just call it what it is. Star Trek Extreme! This is so fucking cool. It is fucking cool. Let's start with the animated Star Trek Utter Drek. Fans were not impressed by this animated addition to Star Trek and even had their comments disabled on the trailer for this crap. I wonder why. You'd be forgiven for thinking this looks like a Rick and Morty ripoff. That's because it sort of is. It's produced by Mike McMahon, who also worked on Rick and Morty, and this guy won an Emmy for that absolute knee slapper of an episode with Pickle Rick. Lower Decks centers on the obnoxious fuckwits on board the USS Cerritos, whose mission is to explore the galaxy to find some fucking jokes. This show desperately tries to grab the Rick and Morty fanbase with its try-hard quirky humor, but it all falls flat. Its concept of comedy is having characters jabbering away like a child who's had their first energy drink. That or the show is simply nudging you to death with Star Trek references. The main characters aren't even that appealing and come off as bland. You have Boimler, the bumbling bumbox, who is the show's cosmic punching bag. I felt sorry for him because he has to put up with his arrogant colleague, Mariner, who is just too cool for school and is about as endearing as irritable bowel syndrome. They go on misadventures with their friends Happy-Go-Lucky Green Girl and Happy-Go-Lucky Autistic Cyborg. No depth to these characters as they are interchangeable. It's clear the writers are sheltered twats from California. The ship is a California class and named after a place in California. A character is from California and there's references to California. We get it. You writers are stuck in your California bubble and don't know shit about anything else. You have no life experience that didn't take place in a fucking Starbucks. So we get a bland, inoffensive Star Trek cartoon. Who is the target audience for this? It's not for kids, as it has bad language and alcoholism. Star Trek fans don't care for it, and Rick and Morty fans won't get the references. Yet CBS want to die on this hill by making more and more crap Star Trek shows because they don't understand their audience. Star Trek Picard Sir Patrick Stewart returns to reprise his role as Jean-Luc Picard in the titular show, which piqued my interest until I found out Alex Kurtzman was writing it. Due to industry nepotism and because Alex worked on the Star Trek films, he gets to create the next batch of Star Trek shows. So not only is he responsible for that loathsome Star Trek discovery, but now he's also violating the corpse of Star Trek The Next Generation with Picard. 
Kurtzman takes plot points about redemption, a grand conspiracy, and a load of sci-fi tropes about artificial intelligence, puts it all into a blender, and pours us out a smoothie of nonsensical shit. The writers on Picard also throw in some ham-fisted commentary on racism and segregation. In fact, everyone seems to have forgotten they live in a post-scarcity utopia, but modern writers like to deconstruct everything we love. Even Sir Patrick was in the writing room to throw in his own personal politics to further mangle the show. How I'd love to have been in the writing room. Mm, I just feel that in the age of Brexit and Trump's administration, we need to really reflect the bigoted times we live in with the Federation. We need to really deconstruct the core of Star Trek and Picard as a privileged white male. Has anyone got any suggestions or questions? I have a question. Are you a rapist? What? I mean, that's essentially what you and Alex Kurtzman are doing with these new shows. You are raping the legacy of Star Trek. I may be a cynical arsehole, but even I can see the good in Gene Roddenberry's optimistic vision of the future. You have a literal utopia scenario, and even that isn't good enough for you. No, destroy it all. Gut all the good parts of Star Trek. Fill it with heck writing and shallow action sequences. I, I really don't see how all this is constructive to anyone, so unless you have some suggestions, you can leave the writing team. <sighs> Picard should have a dog that he calls Number One, because that's what he called his first mate on the Enterprise. Oh, I like that. Yeah, that's quite clever. Kill me. The show's main focus is on a kung fu fighting lady android who is more chin than woman and also has a double. Meanwhile, a shadowy group of pointy-eared Romulans don't like robots and are out to annihilate her and her twin, as well as androids as a species. Somehow, Picard gets dragged into all this mess because... The show calls for him to be involved. So Picard goes on a merry little adventure across the stars to reunite Miss Nuts and Bolts with her robo buddies before the Romulans can twat her. Along the way, there's a bunch of fan service cameos to remind you that yes, this is still the Star Trek you remember and not a horribly written load of cack. The bad writing becomes more and more evident as the show goes on, especially when Picard joins up with an ensemble of assholes because the Federation won't help him. There's a sassy and abrasive pineapple with a side plot that goes nowhere. The mysterious Moonface McGee, edgy Legolas, whose entire character development is killing more and more people. You have the captain of La Sarina, who tries to be some sort of hardened badass but looks like the guy from the Hotel.com adverts. He also has a crew made up of holograms of himself with various quirky personalities. It doesn't offer anything to the plot and feels like an attempt at humour, which is another problem this show faces. There's quite a few comedic moments that don't land and it doesn't help that the tone is wildly inconsistent. But even worse than these cretins is the fact that the existing Star Trek characters have had their personalities mangled. Seven of Nine, who was a socially awkward but a well-meaning inquisitive woman, was turned into a gun-toting, whiskey-drinking caricature. Worst of all, Captain Picard has had his spine removed. Everyone treats him like shit, which basically turns Picard into Star Trek with elder abuse. I've never seen a show with so much padding. Characters keep reiterating to the audience what they are doing and their motivations, but there are also side plots that go nowhere or have a lousy payoff. The show drags its heels for most of the season until Picard finds the planet full of creepy-eyed androids with too much bronze fake tan. All of this leads to the big showdown with boring copy-pasted CGI ships plastered all over the place, pew-pewing each other. It didn't look good in Star Wars, and the same rings true for Star Trek. For me, watching Picard was like visiting an elderly relative in a crappy retirement home. You didn't want to go, because you know it will suck, but you've got no weekend plans, and you do actually love and respect that person. That's what watching Picard is like. Sir Patrick Stewart is a fantastic actor. He can really emote, and even when covered in shit, he gives a great dramatic performance. In Picard, he is starting to show his age. He can't really give out the same energy he used to, or even run up a flight of stairs. A lot of the time he looks tired and about to do a captain's log in his pants. I think Picard was written as 
pure fan service to those who love the next generation, but none of the actors in the original are in their prime anymore. It's depressing. It's geriatric fan service, or grand service as I like to call it. Everyone has gotten old and fat. To top it all off, they are dragged into a bewildering addition to a franchise that is getting badly mishandled by wankers who don't truly care or understand anything about Star Trek. With that said, Star Trek Discovery is probably the worst thing to happen to Star Trek. It's hard to summarize my thoughts on Discovery, so I'll have footage of people vomiting to visualize my thoughts. Yep, sums up my thoughts nicely. Season 3 premiered with a stupid time travel plot and characters that make me want to spoon my eyeballs out. You might as well call this the Michael Burnham Show, as this character is the center of the fucking universe. She's so amazing that I wonder why they bother having any other characters and crewmates in the show. I know the phrase Mary Sue gets thrown around like a cheerleader at a frat party, but Michael Burnham fits the bill. Which is ironic, because the phrase Mary Sue harkens back to the days of bad Star Trek fanfiction, and the origins of the name come from one particularly bad story about a poorly written character called Mary Sue. Now with Michael, we have come full circle. She is an amazing captain, martial artist, extraordinaire, a genius, the adopted sister of Spock, and has the Vulcan mind powers too. Star Trek Discovery is less about logic and more about mysticism, but also it loves to get preachy. Oh, I couldn't finish season 3. It was so badly acted and poorly written. This season and the previous ones are all the same. Pretty visuals, but lacking any substance. I hate it. I just hate it. I hate how it retcons Star Trek. I hate how bad the writing is. And I hate that the whole thing is a mindless sensory overload. There is more to Star Trek than explosions and visuals. The new Star Trek stuff doesn't feel like Star Trek. It's not comfy. The original Star Trek raised the bar for science fiction television, and many new shows tried to do their own thing so they didn't get compared to it. Now, Star Trek is cold and dark, looking more like the Expanse or gritty Battlestar Galactica. Star Trek has lost its identity. We're still People like JJ and Kurtzman don't really care for the source material or the franchise as a whole. All they care about is getting the prestige of working on a classic franchise. Lens flare and hack writing is all we get now. Original Star Trek was a smart show at times and discussed philosophical themes. Sometimes it was sexy, but the sex was also used for humorous moments. It was fun and had a clear identity. Now Star Trek is a sexless, humorless, depressing slog through space. I won't lament Star Trek's fall from grace too much, because there are literally hundreds of good, classic episodes to enjoy. I don't need to watch any of the new stuff. Old Star Trek has all I need. As October came to a close, it was gloomy, with Azerbaijan going to war, there was acts of terrorism in France, and as an extra helping of shit on our Fuck This Year Sunday, Wu flu cases were apparently escalating, meaning that the lockdowns were ineffective. But forget all that, it was the American presidential election! Not even Covid could stop the election. The Yanks and the world eagerly watched as Orange Man Bad took on Dementia Patient Sad. The Republicans wanted four more years of Trump, and the Democrats wanted Bernie Sanders, but he dropped out, so Joe Biden was brought out of cold storage to be the Democrats' doddering candidate. As with any American election, it was an absolute circus, but why should I care? I'm British! Trump wasn't my president, and he's not the president of any other countries. But American media and culture is so prevalent, the world couldn't help but watch to see who was going to be in charge of drone striking the Middle East. Although, it was a sight to behold when it came to the presidential debates, which were nothing more than a cacophony of geriatric squabbling over each other. Yeah, yeah, Mr. President, such a great... single one of them lost... This, but, no, can I be honest? Are you following Are you in it? favor of law and order? Go yes, I'm a, I'm a, you ask a question. It's hard to get any word in with this clown. You're number two. No. Would this take guy. A miracle. He made a statement gentlemen? about the military. He said the a radical question, left... Will you who shut up, man? Listen, who is... As it came closer to election night, the Hollywood elite chimed in to show off their bias and preach to us the importance of voting. 
as long as it was for Biden. Otherwise, you were a stupid redneck and not invited to all the cool celebrity parties. Meanwhile, Trump was producing weapons-grade banter. Here's how you can spot a zombie. Look for someone who has a corpse-like appearance, exhibits aggressive behavior, craves human flesh, and utters incoherent moans and groans. Uh, I don't know. With your help, we can prevent the zombie uprising. I'm Donald Trump, and I approve this message. After all the mudslinging and campaigning, the anticipation of election night gripped the world. At the start, it seemed like Trump's success was assured. But overnight, hundreds of thousands of votes materialized for Biden, and the announcement of the next president was delayed. Soon, there was talk of voter fraud. Well, for a nanosecond, until Twitter started censoring people, including the president. Everything was looking very fishy, and in no time, both sides were pointing fingers and accusing each other of fraud. There were delays in counting the mail-in ballots, so it took days to announce who would be ruler of America which also made people sweat spinal fluid as some dopamine-addled gamblers had put on huge bets for Trump, won to the tune of five million dollars. Oof, someone's getting their legs broke. But it was soon announced Biden was president-elect and accusations of voter fraud would persist up to and beyond the inauguration. Maybe fix your mail-in ballot system, America. But I must say, it was a little suspicious. Biden received more votes than any American president in history. Really? This crypt keeper wannabe is more charismatic than JFK or Obama? Okay. In some ways, I was quite relieved that Trump was gone because now maybe comedians could come up with some new material that wasn't, how about that Trump? Isn't he a bad man? Maybe comedy can get better? <sighs> One can hope. Come the 20th of January, it was made official as the 46th president was sworn in during a Lady Gaga concert. God bless America. Oop, someone sneezed. Everyone get back inside. My country had another lockdown. This time, no one was clapping for the NHS and we became even more demoralized. All those lockdowns and society practically being brought to a standstill had done nothing, apparently. To make matters worse, a new variant of the virus popped up in Denmark that affected mink. The bat soup poop turned into the Copenhagen cough, and it wasn't just the mink stink that was around, as different variations of the Mandarin malady had now materialized. It just never ends. Whether you think COVID is the next black plague or an overblown flu, the consequences of this pandemic are still the same, and that is a fucked economy. Small businesses and retailers in general had been adversely affected by all the lockdowns and restrictions. Many people lost their livelihoods, and 2020 ushered in a new age of digital prostitution. With so many horny locked up people and unemployed young ladies needing sugar daddies, websites like OnlyFans saw a massive increase in the number of content creators. The repercussions of the economic downturn extended to other aspects of society. The world of cinema had been hit dramatically, with many films of popular intellectual properties being delayed. The face of traditional cinema also saw changes as more studios hopped aboard the streaming bandwagon. It's an interesting time, and I'm eager to see how this will affect creativity in the industry, or whether it will make things worse. Suffice to say, things were not handled well in my country. All the fear-mongering created an isolated country, and my government kept using outdated statistical models that predicted 10,000 deaths a day, which never happened. Plus, with all the stupid schemes to help boost the economy and reckless spending, we'll be fucked for years to come. Did we need to close our businesses for a virus that has an extremely low mortality rate? Could we not have just isolated the really vulnerable and continued as normal to help prop up our buggered economy? But I'm not allowed to question the numbers or the narrative, otherwise I'll get labelled a conspiracy theorist or granny killer. <laughs> You'll kill us all! Oh shut up Miss Habisham, go back to being a useless side character. So, how's 2021 been? Well, it's been more of the same shit. Communist lung herpes is here to stay. Even with vaccines being rolled out, cases are still rising in some parts of the world, and there's always a new strain popping up. 
endless political tension between various countries, the economy is fucked beyond belief, and we've got another series of Tiger King. It's not the end of the world, but you can see it from here. The 2020s will be a very tough decade. Strap yourself in. Thank you for watching Smack Talk and supporting Vox's productions through these hard times. It's very much appreciated. You are a good person. I mean, just look at what you are supporting. A lot of positive diversity here. We got a thief, a retard, a sandwich maker, and of course, a handsome man. Hey, I'd like to be serious for a moment. We face some very tough times ahead. The 20s will be a difficult time filled with societal unrest, economic hardships, and all manner of conflicts. Things will not get better for a long time. Your daughter or sister will be selling nude pictures on the internet just to afford a loaf of bread. The rich will get richer and the poor will just kill themselves. Oh, and we've probably got World War Three coming soon. Hard times are here. But I know, we can get through them. Throughout history, humanity has always prevailed through hardship, and this is no different. All this coronavirus stuff, rioting and economic problems have shown us what's really important. Friends and family. With good people by your side, you can endure anything. Prepare for a difficult decade and more, but with any luck, you'll get through it all. And I'll see you on the other side. Now, let's end on a song about ecstasy pills.